League of Legends is an incredibly daunting game to get into. There's over 150 champions, a meta you're supposed to somehow know immediately, a bunch of different objectives, three distinct lanes that play entirely differently, etc. Not only is it difficult to learn everything you need to know, but it also feels like a lot of the existing player base is out to get you, just for being new. We know it can be rough, which is why we've made this guide. Here, we'll be covering seven different quick tips that will help you immediately get better or give you the knowledge to help you improve faster. Let's get right into it. We have to start off this guide with how to build your champion. There's so many different runes and items that it can be overwhelming to know what's right and wrong. The most important thing you're going to need to watch out for in this community is YouTube clickbait. Due to how long matchmaking takes the top elo brackets, many content creators often create smurfs so they can play in lower elo brackets against players they're significantly better than. In any video game, when you're better than someone, you can casually beat them with unorthodox strategies. In this game, it's usually through weird builds on champions. The League of Legends YouTube sphere is littered with this kind of content, and a newer player can easily get baited into building their champions horribly from these kinds of videos. We're not saying all this content isn't fun, educational, or entertaining. Just don't copy items or champion strategies from these sources. When learning how to build your champion, get off YouTube completely and visit a site like u.gg. These kinds of sites tend to show you awesome statistics, such as the win rate of your champion in the specific elo that you're playing in. Runes, skill order, and itemization options are all here as well, and are updated in real time based on what is performing the best on the current patch cycle. Now, don't get us wrong, you're not going to find the best information possible on these websites, but as a newer player, there's no way you can differentiate good information from bad information. There is a ton of super in-depth content out there that dives deep into how champions work and how to maximize their efficiency, but until you become more comfortable with the game, stick to something like u.gg and don't overthink things too much. Things will come with time as you get better and better. Now let's get into some gameplay advice, and the following two tips are major issues that newer players face, mostly because people who don't know any better are giving you bad advice as you're starting out. These two issues have to deal with objectives, and the biggest thing that tends to lead players astray has got to be the dragon. The amount of games we see lost as a result of players overforcing this neutral objective is absurd. Don't get us wrong, the dragon is very useful, especially once you've stacked four of them to get the dragon soul, which is a massive buff well worth investing into. But each of the individual dragons are not that important, especially during the early stages of the game. Let's show you what we mean. As of right now, the Mountain Dragon's passive is considered by a wide margin the best of them all. It gives you free resistances, which makes you tankier. But after killing it, a standard champion like Ari only gains 3 armor and 2 magic resistance, which equates to about a 1% damage reduction. Yes, this scales a bit more as the game goes on, but your games will almost never be decided by something this insignificant. Just keep in mind that both you and your opponents need four dragons to get the buff that will actually win you the game. The individual dragons themselves are often not worth taking poor fights over. We don't want you to feel pressured that you need to contest every single one. You need to think about how good or bad the fight you're about to take is and make an appropriate decision based off of that. Don't overforce and lead your team to doom just for an inconsequential buff. And like we mentioned, Dragon isn't the only objective that newer players throw over. Some advice you've probably heard by now is to focus on taking enemy towers so that you can open up the map and win the game. This is going to sound really obvious, but you need to remember that dealing damage to towers does not do anything unless you take the whole structure. They'll still be standing, dealing the same amount of damage, and not give you any gold. The only exception is before 14 minutes, while the turret plates are still up, of course. These are actually worth taking. Here's the most important rule you need to follow in regards to hitting towers. If you cannot completely demolish the tower for certain, then never hit them if you have literally anything else you could be doing. For a visual of how bad this can be, let's check out a gameplay example. During this game, the blue team just got Baron, which enables them to defend their base at a moment's notice with the enhanced recall part of the buff. Meanwhile, the Fiora knows this is the case, but continues pushing all the way to the inhibitor tower regardless. In a shocking turn of events, someone was there to defend, and she gets appropriately punished for her greed. Even if she didn't get killed immediately here, she'd only have been able to deal at most 50% of the tower's health before someone came to defend. At the start of her decision to push through, we can see that the enemy's Gromp camp was available for the taking. Farming that single camp would have been more beneficial for her than dealing irrelevant damage to the tower, plus it doesn't put her in any danger to do so, unlike the pushing she did. It's around 100 gold and experience or nothing as a reward. When visualized like this, it should be clear to you why this rule exists in the first place, and we highly suggest you follow it. Up next is an incredibly subtle thing that costs newer and even more experienced players a lot of losses. It's also very hard to pinpoint and learn yourself because it happens at the literal beginning of a game. 
champion select. While you should always play whatever you enjoy most, if you're a player who doesn't mind what they're picking, then you really need to keep this following tip in mind. In League of Legends, it is far better to have an excess of attack damage rather than having too many ability damage focused champions. Generally, champions who build ability power are more burst oriented. What this means is that they want to kill their opponents in one or maybe two rotations of their spells at most. There are exceptions to this rule of course, but that will usually be the case. What this means though is that if the champion can't successfully kill you in those one or two rotations, that those champions become very ineffective. This is the reason a lot of games can be lost right from the get-go. If you have a team composition with a surplus of magic damage, then your opponents are much more easily able to build magic resistance. Magic resist will prevent you from killing them with burst, again, making your champion perform significantly worse. Not only that, but ability power champions are generally a bit more reliant on the crowd control in their kits. When a team is so freely able to stack merc treads, it's doubly efficient. You're basically countering the burst of the AP champion and reducing the CC in their kit. It's a super hard counter item. On the other hand, champions who build attack damage obviously rely on their spells as well, but they can always finish off kills with auto attacks. They never really run out of damage. Here's a visual demonstration of how important this is. Jinx, the AD champion, has built Hex Drinker against Lux. This is a very cheap magic resist item if you don't know. Lux, the AP champion, built Zhonya's Hourglass, which is a high tier armor item for mages. Despite intentionally face tanking Lux's combo, not using any spells, being down in items, and not even positioning properly, Jinx can still auto attack the Lux down easily. Once her three spells were on cooldown, Lux was just out of damage for a while and couldn't do much else. Magic resist is just too effective into mages, therefore your team compositions should look something like this. You'd ideally want three champions who deal decent attack damage, then a supportive or tank champion, and a single source of heavy magic damage. This makes counter itemization hard for your opponents. If they build armor, then your AD champions can still deal significant damage, and the mage is going to absolutely take over the game. And if they build magic resist against a single source of magic damage, then your AD champions will obviously go crazy. Again, always play what you enjoy the most, but try to consider this concept as you're drafting your own team, or even thinking about how to itemize against the enemy's team. You'll avoid a lot more losses, and take advantage of bad team compositions more often by keeping this in mind. It's fair to say that many newer players coming into League are often drawn in by the hype tournaments, or many montages that you'll see everywhere for this game. Being able to pull off the stuff you see professional players do is obviously something many of you are striving towards. Well, one of the most important skills used in most of those highlight moments is based on learning how your auto attack works and how to appropriately move while attacking your opponent. For all auto attacks, there is both a wind up and a wind down. The wind up is the animation your character does right before it throws its projectile, or it applies the damage as a melee champion. And the wind down animation is a brief animation your champion does after the wind up. These animations speed up as you buy attack speed. The trick to being more fluid in your movement is to cancel your wind down after each auto attack. This animation isn't necessary and can be canceled via any movement command. We highly suggest you start familiarizing yourself with these animations on the champions you plan on playing most often. League is a game that heavily rewards players with good mechanics and movement, and being stuck in animations much longer than anyone is going to put you at a severe disadvantage. And we know this sounds complicated, but, but trust us that the explanation is much harder than it actually is. You're mostly just getting the feel of how your character attacks. Don't overthink and stare at your animations as you test this. Just see how long it takes your auto attack to go off and how quickly you can move afterwards. Do that and you'll master this in no time. Next up, the chat feature. Your chat box is both the most useful way of winning a game, but also the reason you will lose 99% of your matches. Depending on what type of player you are, you can obviously disable it however you wish in the settings here. This is by far the best settings in the game. But the second best chat feature is one a lot of players take a while to figure out, which is to turn on timestamps. This just lets you see when a message was sent in the chat. The real benefit of doing so is so that you can accurately time your opponent's cooldowns, specifically their flash. So if you go on the scoreboard and left click their summoner spell, it'll put it in your chat. With timestamps, this makes tracking your opponent's cooldowns incredibly easy. Keeping track of your opponent's flash cooldown is very important, as it allows both very offensive and defensive plays. For example, as Graves comes in to gank the enemy Yone in top, things go poorly. His opponent plays fairly well and manages to kill Cho'Gath afterwards, making a clean getaway. At the very least though, his flash has been burned and Graves pings it in the chat. Later in the game, you should know that you can enlarge your chat with the default keybind Z. This lets Graves easily find when he pinged Yone's flash in the chat. Flash is a 5 minute cooldown. He remembers he pinged it like 5 seconds after his opponent used it, so estimates this timer. 
A while later into the game, Yone tries to kill Graves as he's doing his jungle camps. As you can see, by accurately timing Yone's flash, Graves can communicate to his Cho'Gath that they should keep chasing, since Yone's cooldown is not up yet. Not only that, but a bit later into the game, Graves knows he still has about a 30 second time window to punish his opponent. He makes his way up to top and scores yet another kill. Hopefully, it's clear just how important the timestamp setting is to help time your opponent's cooldowns. Being certain of what you can and can't do is an advantage you cannot overlook. And our final tip is a super quick but important one. You should hopefully know by now to enable the quick casting function for all your spells in the hotkeys section. If you haven't already, then you really need to do so. This makes it so you don't need to click a spell, see the indicator, and then click again to cast. The difference between a player using normal cast and quick cast is night and day. As we've already discussed before, fluid and faster movement is pivotal to your success, so you'd need to get used to quick casting as soon as you can. But that isn't to say that there isn't a use for normal casting your abilities. You ideally want to make separate hotkeys to cast all your normal spells. Usually players do this with a shift modifier, but do whatever is comfortable for you. Seeing the range and width indicator of your spells is really important in certain cases. In fact, some champions like Twisted Fate are really reliant on seeing these indicators just to kill minions. It doesn't hurt to make these keybinds, and even if you don't get used to them right away, you'd ideally want to slowly integrate them into your gameplay. Now, what you find here on YouTube is just the tip of the iceberg. If you want to unlock your true potential, then you need to dive into skillcap.com. We have the largest catalog of League of Legends guides in the entire world with over 1,500 guides and 350 unique courses. You get brand new guides every week exclusive to our website, along with our Smurf commentaries where our challenger experts walk you through how to carry out of the exact rank you're stuck in. Still unsure? Well, you can have all your questions answered by those same challenger experts. Need one-on-one -on -one coaching? We got you covered with hand-picked coaches trained to the highest standard. Don't have time for that? Use Direct Pro, pick a past game you played, and within 24 hours get a personalized video from a top 100 challenger player breaking down exactly what you can do better. The best part, all of this comes with a rank improvement guarantee. If you don't climb at least 5 divisions while actively using Skillcap, you can claim a refund, no questions asked. So what are you waiting for? Head to Skillcap.com and get the rank you've always wanted, link in the description below. Alright guys, those are our top tips for helping you get more acquainted with this game. We know how hard things are for you, but hopefully this guide made things just a bit easier for you to overcome the massive hurdle you're going through to try to get into this game. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll catch you next time.